Good morning, everyone. Joy to greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, this morning, and good to, to see everybody out there. I love looking at the church at 1035 when we start, and then when I come up here uh, at 1115, how filled out it has become. It's great to see everybody. Well, we're going to be continuing in our uh, study of the living church this morning, and we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 21. So if you'd like to follow along, pick up a Bible and open it up. It's, uh, we're going to be looking at the word of the Lord from there this morning, Paul's letter, second letter to Corinth. And let me pray before we read today. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of your word. And we thank you for the opportunity to come together, to gather around your word, to hear it read and preached. And we pray this morning that you would speak to us once again. Lord, we remember uh, when Peter was talking to his disciples, he said, what about you? Will you leave me also? And they said, you have the words of eternal life. Where else will we go? And so, Lord, as we gather around your word this morning, that is what we are looking for, your word of eternal life. So would you open our hearts to receive it once again this morning? We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but we are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, as we keep going uh, through our, this series in the Living Church, uh, this is based uh, loosely on a book I've said in here before, uh, on a book by a man named John Stott called The Living Church. It's a book near, that he wrote near the end of his life after more than a 60-year career in ministry as a pastor in England, and so he knows of what he speaks when he talks about what it means to be a living church. And the book considers what are the marks of a living church, a church that is alive in Christ. And so each week we're going to be exploring these different things, these different marks. I hope what we will come to uh, by the end of this, this sermon series um, is one, a better understanding of what it looks like to be a church that is alive in Christ. What does that look like? What are the things that mark a church where the Holy Spirit is alive and active uh, within the body of believers? But also, I hope that we will come away with some uh, better sense of what it means to be a part of the church, the importance and the beauty of being part of the church, as Joe was talking about uh, before he prayed. How important it is to be connected with the body of Christ. And it is not a given that we would be able to have that gift. So that we would know what it means to come here on Sunday mornings, but also to be involved in each other's lives outside uh, during the week. What does it mean to be a part of the body of Christ? That's what I hope we will come to a greater appreciation of when we get to the end of this sermon series. And so we also want to think about what do people experience when they are part of a living church? What do people experience when they're part of a living church? What kind of a fruit does that church produce, a living church? What kind of fruit does it produce? And so far we've talked about the church's identity and task, who the church is, what it has been called to do. And last week, we talked about worship as being the first mark or quality of a living church. 
And this week, we're going to be talking about evangelism. Evangelism. Now, some of you hear the word evangelism, and it gets you excited. You hear the word evangelism, and you get excited. You think, yes, let's go. Let's, let's go do it now. I am ready. We're going to head down to Wenceslas Square, and we are going to start evangelizing. Some of you think that way. But for some of you, or maybe people you know, evangelism, you may think of it more as the E word, right? Something not to be mentioned in polite company, right? When we talk about evangelism, we think of it as the ministry that shall not be named. Uh, One book I read recently said that most people would rather get a root canal than do evangelism. Most people would rather get a root canal than do evangelism. I think it may be true to say that A lot of people would rather get a root canal than even talk about evangelism, right? We don't even want to think about this. There's something about evangelism that for some of us, we are really truly gifted for it, and we're good at it, and it excites us, just like any gift of the Spirit. But for some of us, it makes us really uncomfortable. We find it really uncomfortable to think about evangelism, to talk about evangelism. Uh, It might conjure up images of knocking on people's doors or of standing in a public place and handing out tracts, trying to strike up conversations with people that we don't know, uh, talking to strangers, all with the intent of persuading people to make a decision to accept Jesus so that they can be saved. And I'll confess to you that this for a long time has been my caricature of evangelism, right? That, That it means going out to a public place and just walking up to people, cold turkey, and start talking to them about Jesus. And that terrifies me. That terrifies me. And I've done it before, and it still terrifies me. And then I I joined a ministry uh, to high school students that was more about relational evangelism, where you start a relationship with people uh, with the purpose of then building that relationship, building that bridge, and then crossing that bridge to talk to them about Jesus Christ, which is a more uh, maybe comfortable way of thinking about it, but it still terrified me. I'll just confess to you all, it still terrified me, this idea of how we do it. And we have to admit that there can be a cost to evangelism. There are things at stake. And depending on where you're from or where you live, that could be just something as far as a social stigma where people look at you funny because you talk about Jesus. Or for some people, it can even mean that your life is put at risk if you share your faith with others. And so let's not pretend that there is nothing at stake in evangelism, that there is sort of a cost cost and a risk to us. But I hope for this morning, we can put some of those things at least uh, in the back of our minds to hear a little bit about what the scriptures have to say about evangelism. And there are three things that I want to talk about this morning as we think about evangelism as a mark of a living church, that this is something that a living church does and engages in. And the first, these three things uh, are this, what is it? What is evangelism? That's the first question. Second is, why do we do it? And third is, how do we do it? And I might say some humble thoughts on how we do it, okay? So those are the three things that we're going to be looking at this morning. First, what is it? Two, why do we do it? And three, how do we do it? Or how might we go about doing it? That's probably a better way to say that. So the first one, first point is this. What is evangelism? What are we even talking about when we use this word? And so the first thing that we want to look at is it comes from the Greek word euangelion. I put the Greek word in Greek letters at the bottom there just so you all can see what it looks like. It's the euangelion, which simply means good message or good news, right? That's what we're talking about when we talk about evangelism. We are sharing the good news. You might see in that word euangelion, the word angel in there, right? Uh, Angels are God's messengers. It's the same root word, right? So it's the good message. That's what we're sharing. The other churchy word that we use with this meaning is gospel. Gospel means the same thing. It's the good word or the good message. So when we're talking about evangelism, we're simply talking about sharing good news. That's what it means. Now, when we talk about it that way, that's not so bad, is it, right? Sharing good news with other people. Who doesn't want to hear good news? Hey, guys, I've got good news this morning. Who wants to hear it, right? Thank you. See, and most of us, most of us would say yes to that. It's rare that you get somebody who says, not today. I don't want any good news today. Maybe sometimes if you're really grumpy, but for the most part, people are happy to get good news. So this is a good thing. And when we think about it that way, it seems not so bad. 
But we know with evangelism that it's more complicated than that because of the content of the message. Evangelism doesn't mean sharing just any good news. It's a very specific good news that we are sharing. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the good news that the church has to bring to the world. The good news of Jesus Christ. I came across a a blog post this week uh, that was marking the 50th anniversary of the Lausanne Covenant. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, uh, but in 1974, evangelical church leaders from all around the world, they gathered in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, And John Stott, who wrote the book, The Living Church, that we are are looking at uh, during this sermon series, he was sort of the main architect of this meeting and this statement. They put out a statement on the priority of world events evangelization. And it's a really good statement. It's worth looking at and reading and seeing what it has to say. And it's more than just a statement. It's a covenant. They call it the Lausanne covenant because they were making a commitment to each other and to God to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. And so we're going to be looking at a few quotes. It was serendipitous that I ran into this blog post this week. It wasn't, it wasn't, part of, uh, wasn't planned on my part. Uh, but we're going to be looking at a few quotes from the Lausanne Covenant during our sermon this morning. But this is how it defines evangelism. It says this, To evangelize is to spread the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins and was raised to the de- from the dead according to the scriptures, and that as the reigning Lord, he now offers the forgiveness of sins and the liberating gifts of the Spirit to all who repent and believe. This is what we're doing when we evangelize, right? We are spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, and that now the forgiveness of sins and the uh, the liberating gifts of the Spirit are offered to all those who would repent and believe. In the Gospel of Luke, uh, we're told several times that Jesus came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And then when we look at the book of Acts, which was also written by Luke, it's sort of Luke's sequel, we see that there's a little shift because all of a sudden the apostles, they go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Because it is in the person of Jesus Christ that the kingdom of God has come near. In the passage that we read, uh, that we read this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks, talks about it in terms of reconciliation. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Two things that were separate from each other, God and the world, or, or God and all of humankind, are being brought back together in Jesus Christ. There was a relationship that was broken. It was broken, we read about it in Genesis chapter three with Adam and Eve and the fall of humankind. And so there wasn't any sort of reconciliation there at first, but when Jesus came, he brought us back together. In some places in scripture, the the image is used of actually being enemies with God, that we were living in enmity with him, but that God made peace through Jesus Christ. But the idea is the same, that the relationship that was broken by sin has been restored through Jesus' incarnation and crucifixion and resurrection. Friends, in Jesus Christ, the way has been opened for us to be brought back into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Our sins have been forgiven and they are no longer counted against us. Please hear that if you hear nothing else this morning, that your sins have been forgiven and they are no longer counted against you in Jesus Christ. Christ. That is not something that we could have done for ourselves. And so God did it for us. And this is the good news. This is the gospel, the evangel. So what is evangelism? It is sharing good news. And what is that good news? Jesus Christ is that good news. So a quick note uh, before we move on to our second point, uh, which is two things that evangelism is not. Um, One, I think it's important for us to think about this because sometimes we get these things mixed up or they're gray areas. Uh, Evangelism is not social action. It's not social action. Feeding people who are hungry or housing people who are homeless or fighting injustice, these are important things, the important actions of the church. And they're an important way of sharing the good news. But social action is not the sole content of evangelism. Those activities can serve as a tool for evangelism as much as they point beyond themselves to Jesus Christ and God's coming kingdom. But in and of themselves, they are not evangelism. 
And the second one is this, evangelism is not a church growth strategy. Now, this may be a very American way of thinking about it, but this is sometimes what happens. Uh, We think we need to get more people to come to church. Let's do some evangelism, right? And often what's meant by that is really more church marketing, right? Now, true, if a church is effective at evangelizing, there is a good chance that it will grow, but it may not, and that's okay, And on the flip side, to have effective church marketing, it may get people in the building, but that's not necessarily having shared the good news with people. I remember Vail and I had the opportunity to go to Kenya uh, several years ago, about a decade ago now, when we met a pastor who was there. He, uh, I'm Presbyterian. He was in the Presbyterian church there. It blew our minds to find out that there are at least two times as many Presbyterians in East Africa as there are in the United States, and that's not uncommon. And we talked to him as a pastor, and we found out that part of his training as a pastor was to spend several years as an evangelist before he could be the pastor of a church. And all of a sudden, it made me realize, well, there's a reason that this church is growing so much because their pastors have to do evangelism for so long. It's just part of who they are as a church, something that maybe we've lost in some other parts of the world. So the problem with both of these views, that evangelism is, is social action or, uh, or it's a church growth strategy, is that it makes evangelism less than what it is meant to be. It's not that they're bad things, not in bad activities to engage in, in and of themselves. They can be very good. But to limit evangelism to these views loses sight of the goal. People need to know that they have been reconciled to the God who created them and that this reconciliation has happened through Jesus Christ. And we have to be able to make that connection in whatever activities, other activities we do as a church uh, to call it evangelism. So that's what we mean by evangelism. That's what we mean by evangelism. So point number two, why do we do it? Why do we do it? Why should we share the good news of Jesus Christ? And I think there are a couple of different reasons that we do evangelism. Why should we do it? Um, The first one is this. It has to do with God's character. Why should we share the good news of Jesus Christ? The priority, I think, of all the reasons we could do it is because it rests on God's character, on who God is and what God has done. This is what every sermon is supposed to do, to lay before us God's character as revealed to us in the scriptures, so that we may know and worship him as he truly is. And whatever moral exhortations come out of a sermon, whatever go and do this message comes out of it, it must, be, it must stem from the proclamation of who God is. Another way to think of it is to say this is, this is who God is or this is what God is like. And as people created in God's image, this is how we are to live in response to what God is like. This is what worship is. It's our faithful response to God's character. And I appreciate that, that Stott in his book points out the preeminent responsibility of the church is not evangelism, it's worship, as we talked about last week. It is to glory in God's holy name, as Psalm 105 says. The main job of the church is what we do here on Sunday mornings and everything else we do that stems from our worship. God is holy, and we gather together each week to declare him the only one worthy of our praise. This is our faithful response to who God is. But again, as Stott has said, the church has a dual nature. We are called out of the world and then sent back into it. Worship and evangelism are two sides of the same coin. The Lausanne Covenant again says it this way, We affirm the belief that the one eternal God, creator and Lord of the world, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who governs all things according to the purpose of his will, He has been calling out from the world a people for himself and sending his people back into the world to be his servants and his witnesses for the extension of his kingdom, for the building up of Christ's body, and for the glory of his name. This is what God has been doing with his people since he made a covenant with Abraham. He calls the people out of the world for himself to be his people, to worship him, and then he sends those very people back into the world to tell the world about him and to show the world what it means to be his people. This is the call of Israel. This is the call of the church. God is a God who wants to be reconciled to his people. God wants people to know him and to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so the history of the world is the story of God pursuing his people in order to call them to repentance. 
In the book Evangelism in the Early Church, uh, Michael Green, the author, he points out just how radical this message was in the first century when the church came together. He said, most religious people back then were searching for God. And then Christians come along with the message that God was in search of us. And this flipped everything on its head. We go into the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ because in Christ, God entered the world to tell us about himself. This is the message of the incarnation, the God who took on flesh and dwelt among us. And so our ministry is to be incarnational as well, to go out into the world and to live amongst the people, to tell them about Jesus Christ and his great love for them. The Father sent the Son, the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit, and now we, the church, are sent into the world in the power of the Spirit to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We go because Jesus went. We pursue others because God pursued us. It is part of God who God is. He is a reconciling God, and he has entrusted us with his ministry of reconciliation. And so that's the main reason why we do evangelism. We go because of who God is and because of who we are to be in light of who God is. As Paul said in our passage this morning, we are Christ's ambassadors as though he were making his appeal through us. We have been entrusted with his ministry of reconciliation. And I promise you, friends, that God cares more that people come to know him than we do. The people that we are sharing the good news with, Jesus cares more about them coming to faith even than we do. So now, this is why we do, oh no, excuse me, not why we do evangelism, we're still there. So there's a couple of other reasons. Uh, Second is this, Christ's instruction. We do evangelism, one, because of who God is, but second, because of Christ's instruction. We go because Christ tells us to go. He said in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all of creation. This is uh, one of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. Go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And then Matthew chapter 28, again, the risen Christ, and this is maybe the most well-known passage that people use when talking about evangelism, the Great Commission. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In some ways, it's as simple as that. We go and evangelize because we have been told to by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, hopefully, uh, this isn't a gritting of our teeth kind of obedience in going to do this, and that we say, I have to do this, or else I'm going to get in trouble if I don't. God's going to be unhappy with me. And I do think that's sometimes why we go about and evangelize. But I hope that it would be more like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, our passage today, that Christ's love would compel us, that Christ's love would compel us. We've been instructed to do so, but we also go because Jesus loved us enough to pursue us. And we might love others so much that we want to pursue them for the sake of the gospel. And then a sub point, point two, uh, 2.1, is I think that evangelism is good for us. This is another reason we do it. We do it out of obedience, but obedience is always good for us in the Christian life. Right? John Calvin, uh, one of the, the great reformers, says that, that all true knowledge of God is born from obedience. That there is something in obeying God that is good for us as individuals and also for us as a church, that God will use it in our lives. It's an exercise in faith. We step out in obedience and we trust that God is going to meet us there. We don't know exactly what the response is going to be, but we trust that God is going to meet us in our obedience to him and to strengthen our faith and build us up through it. So that's the second reason why we do it, because of Christ's instruction. And the third reason is this, people need to hear the good news. People need to hear the good news. If we really believe what we say, that real and true and eternal life, the life that we were created for, the life that we're meant to live comes from knowing Christ and living a new life in communion with him, then other people should know about this truth so that they can be made new creations as well. Paul says this uh, in in the book of Romans chapter one. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And then Paul goes on to write more in Romans where he says, faith comes from hearing 
But how can they hear if nobody tells them? How can they hear if nobody tells them? 2 Corinthians 5 is also talking about this idea as well. Because we have come to know the Lord, because we know what it means to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. Again, Paul says his love compels us because he died so that people no longer have to live for themselves, but can live for him who died for them and was raised again. We want people to know this good news because here and now it matters. It matters for this life, but it also matters for the life of the world to come. That there are, uh, it matters for our eternal lives as well. So we want people to come to faith so that they might be saved and have eternal life in Jesus Christ. So these are the reasons that we do evangelism. There are more too, but these are the three to highlight this morning. And now point number three, how might we go about evangelism? How might we go about it? And this will not be an exhaustive uh, exploration of this idea by any means. Uh, it's very going to be very little detail to it. There's really no one right way to evangelize. Uh, and in some ways, I'm going to let you off the hook a little bit by pointing back to Stott and what we see in Scripture. But the truth is that the church is called to evangelism. We are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It is part of our apostolic nature that we are sent, and there is no getting around that. Uh, Again, Lausanne says this, world evangelization requires the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. The church is at the very center of God's cosmic purpose and his appointed means of spreading the gospel. It requires the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. But I deliberately say church because it is also true that evangelism is a gift of the Holy Spirit that not all of us have. Some of you have been thinking all morning, I don't have this gift. I don't have the gift of evangelism, of just going up and sharing my faith with other people. And and that's okay. Some of us are really good at talking about Jesus Christ with other people. It just comes naturally. And if you're one of those people, then God bless you and please keep using that gift. Few people are gifted like Billy Graham, the American evangelist of the last century, to speak to thousands or even millions of people about Jesus and thank God for them and for their gift. But for the rest of us, we're called to do it together as a church, to share the good news of Jesus Christ in word and deed as the body. So you're not completely off the hook. You do have to evangelize. You are called to evangelism, but you don't have to go it alone. You don't have to go it alone. We have a team, a body. This is an exercise that we can do together. Even when we look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two so that they weren't by themselves in doing this. So what does it look like? What might it look like for us? Well, you might look for opportunities to share with people you know to start and to pray for them and to be open to these opportunities as they they come to you. Uh, If you sense that people might be interested in your faith or what you believe or want to talk about Jesus Christ, to look for those opportunities and, and again, pray for them, that God would open doors to share your faith with other people. We might also remember that we said worship and evangelism are two sides of the same coin. And I think there's a case to be made that evangelism is simply taking what we do in here on Sunday mornings out of this room and out of this building and into our homes and neighborhoods and schools and workplaces We might think about how we acknowledge Jesus Christ in our daily lives just as we go about life and give him credit for what he's done for us, that that could be a place that we start as well. The way we do outreach as a church is a part of our witness. It's a vital part. The ways that we care for and love this world, especially those who are in great need or at the margins of society. This is part of our communal witness. But along with our good deeds, it's vital to let people know that it is Christ's love that compels us. We serve because Christ came to serve. And perhaps most importantly, our fellowship with one another is a vital part of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We should start here and always return to this part of it. Do we love each other? Do we love each other in this room? Do we uh, share this love with each other by word and deed? Jesus says that by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And no matter what else we say and do as a church, how we love each other will speak the most loudly about God's love for us and God's love for the world. 
If people want to know what we are telling them is really true, they're going to look and see how it plays out in our lives. Do we really love one another the way that Christ loved us? Or in our broken and in weak ways, do we try to at least do it? Michael Green, again, the author of Evangelism in the Early Church, had this to say. He said, the, church, the early church had qualities unparalleled in the ancient world. Nowhere else would you find slaves and masters, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, engaging in table fellowship and showing a real love for one another. That love overflowed to outsiders, and in times of plague and disaster, the Christians shone by means of their service to the communities in which they lived. We see that this happens throughout the book of Acts, that there was something different about that early church, something that compelled people to want to be a part of it. Sometimes that's where evangelism starts, is people looking and saying, you know, I don't know if I believe what you're telling me about God or about Jesus Christ, but I see something in your community and in your life with other people that I want to be a part of that's different from the rest of the world. And sometimes that's the bridge that comes. And so we do it as a church, friends. We do it as a church by the way that we love each other, by the way that we serve together, by the way people see us in community with each other. To close today, I want to make one final point, which is this, that evangelism, like all ministry, is a work of the Holy Spirit, and it is not up to us. Acts chapter 2, verse 47 says this, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's the Holy Spirit who has called us. It's the Holy Spirit who sends us. It's the Holy Spirit who speaks through us. And only the Holy Spirit can open someone's heart to receive the good news and to believe on Jesus Christ. And so friends, it is not up to you to save anybody. That is God's work alone. For us, it is enough to lift high the name of Jesus and to tell of all he's done until heaven and earth are full of his glory. So remember this morning the good news, friends, that Christ came into the world to save sinners like you and like me He lived and died and was raised again that we might be reconciled to God and that we might live from now on as new creations. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we we give you thanks for the good news. We thank you that it's true. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, your only Son, that you came to earth, that you pursued us, that you found us, that you called us to faith in yourself. Lord, we know it's your desire for all people to come to know you and to put their faith and trust in you. And so we pray that you would use us as your ambassadors, as your witnesses, that our lives might in some way reflect the great love that you have for us and for this world in Jesus Christ. And that you would bless our church, Lord, would your Holy Spirit be alive in this church and in all churches so that people might look at the way that we live together and love one another, that you might use that in some way to draw them to faith. Lord, we pray today, even those for those on our minds, our friends, our loved ones, people we know who are far from you, we ask that you would open their hearts to receive your good news and put their faith in you. And Lord, would you, would you open doors and conversations for us to speak the truth of your love into their lives. We ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.